Well, welcome back to Shimping Park Farm. Well, it's been very wet, but we have finished planting all our seeds, or sowing as we call it. And we've been on tour, talking about all things progressive farming. On the sheep front, the rams, or the daddy sheep, have been in with the ewes, the mummy sheep, tupping. <laughs> a crayon, waxy crayon marker that goes on the brisket of the rams or the taps. Um, like this is a harness, it's nice and sort of padded on the sides um, and uh, it doesn't hurt, hurt them. Why do you want to rattle on them? Uh, so you can rattle for a lot of different reasons um, but we'd, well, I'd, I'd like to just split the lambing group down so we're about day 10-ish, day 10, day 11 of tupping. Um, so We'd, we'll be, the tups will be in for about four to five weeks. Uh, the first cycle is 17 odd days. So the tail end of this first cycle and the second cycle sheep will get a mark on them. So it shows you who's due when? Anything without a mark will be in hopefully the first 10 days and anything with a mark will be after the first 10 days. We don't have any sort of late lambs mixed in with very early lambs and it'll make everything a little bit easier hopefully as long as, long as they haven't already got on with the job and everything's done in 10 days. On the other side of the farm, Greg is busy separating the wheat from the beans. You may remember that we grew them together in the same field and we harvested them together. Now we're separating the seeds out. So the mixed seed goes into this trailer down into the sieves, this huge mobile sieve. It gets shaken about. And out of one side comes the beans, and out of the other side comes the wheat. These are the clean beans. This is the clean wheat. So we're at Stansted Airport uh, in East Anglia, our local airport, and we're going to um, Dublin because I'm speaking at the Irish Bio Farm Conference at 2.45 this afternoon. Really excited. What are you going to be talking about? So I'm doing a talk about the possibilities of organic no-till. So what I'm going to really focus on is actually how you can potentially achieve that it's still, and still controlling weeds. Uh, hopefully I'm going to answer some questions but also stimulate some uh, debate within the audience about how it can be done. I think it's you know, really important seeing other farmers face to face um, because actually it's not until farmers get together that they start to really exchange knowledge. And our next speaker is uh, John Pawsey. You know, one of, one of the big problems with doing less tillage is weeds, because if you do less tillage, uh, you do get more weeds. And we can't get rid of all our weeds. We just don't let any one weed dominate. And the quote, the Gay Brown quote, was absolutely fantastic that you put up about, you know, uh, along the lines of, you know, don't let perfect get away with being good. It's so important. I think that we've de-skilled ourselves as uh, an industry in the way that we've relied on people selling us inputs uh, to tell us that you know this is what we should be doing, and, and I'm terribly sorry, you're going to need an agronomist now because it's far too complicated for you yeah. to understand. I think we've got to get back our confidence, and we've got to get out there. As Robbie said, just do one little thing. I've come to learn more about other farmers and learn from all other experiences and <laughs> mistakes and from experts. I'm here as a as a farmer trying to learn and improve and see how we can do things a bit better. Very interesting on John's thoughts on. Reduce intelligent and organic farming, that's really something that I think we all need to try and learn about because it's the real sticking point. Yes. Has it been a good conversation? Absolutely fantastic. Very honest, very open, a lot of questioning. We have realised that Mother Nature or Nature is a far superior alchemist than we are. Everyone even the chemical conventional farmers are looking hard at how we can do it with less inputs and to take out the use of artificial nitrogen. What's the future of bio farming or organics in Ireland? Strong. 
really, really glad that we made the effort to come out here and do some sort of face-to-face -face, uh, talking and learning uh, with um, Irish farmers who are doing amazing things through uh, Base Island, uh, but outside Base Island, just really embracing this sort of regenerative agricultural thing. Well, back on the farm, George and Cameron are busy weighing the last of the fat lambs as we reach the end of our season of selling lambs. Yeah, they're weighing really well. Um, yeah, most of them are 50 kilos. Uh, I think the top was 56. Uh, yeah, quite a lot of 51s, 52s. Our lambs are only fed grass and clover, no concentrated bought in feeds, so we are very dependent on the weather. It gets dark really early now, so they've got their work cut out trying to do everything in the daylight. to Denmark. Well, we're at a organic farming conference in Denmark, uh, which I'm really pleased to be invited to speak at. I'm talking about sustainability and climate neutrality. Sustainability is a really difficult one because it means so many different things to different people. Uh, but ultimately, we do need to make a profit. Uh, in an organic system, it certainly means, and I would say in any system, it means working with less pesticides. I can't believe that we want to still keep on spraying the amount of pesticides we have been spraying. Uh, also, artificial fertilizers. There's lots you can do to build soil fertility without using artificial fertilizers. Um, uh, and I think that, you know, just these, these systems working with nature, by their nature, promotes uh, more wildlife on farms. The key message about um, climate neutrality is how, as farmers, uh, can we capture carbon within our farming systems uh, so that we help, you know, soak up that carbon that's going into the atmosphere. Uh, but I'm just going to touch on the things that I feel really passionate about. That's the state organic. It's state certified organic. Yeah, we had the legislation coming in 87. Okay. And then okay. we had this uh, label system coming in 89. Okay. And the EU came with the legislation and guidelines in 91. So, okay. so uh, what we say is that often the, the Danish state was the first actually to move on uh, regulation on organic. About 94% of all Danes know what this sign means. Wow. Of course, there's a lot more in it, but most consumers know no pesticides, no artificial fertilizers, better uh, animal welfare. 13, 14% of the uh, area of the farmland uh, being organic, certified. It's absolutely mainstream. You'll find, uh, you can't, I think you can't find one retail shop that don't carry quite a, a, a big variety of organic products. Actually, a really good government uh, who want organic production and uh, we have a really good uh, uh, minister. Uh, he makes sure that uh, their ambition the, until 2030, they want to double up the production and they are really focusing about selling all the production to uh, in Denmark and also to export. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me to come and speak at your congress. It's uh, very generous of you. People are, are coming to us and they're wondering how we are still building fertility in our soils. One of the biggest things, to my mind, was actually bringing livestock back on the farm. So we extended the rotation the last 20 years, working out what kind of mixtures work well on your farm, on your soil type, to build the most fertility and to uh, get those soil microbes working. Uh, as far as weeds are concerned, it's just constantly changing the rotation. We've got more nature on the farm than we did when we converted. And so, you know, I can't stress how important it is to uh, do everything you possibly can to build your soil organic matter, not just for the health of your soils, but also uh, to help us sequester uh, more carbon. Ultimately, at the end of the day, uh, we are more profitable farming in the way that we have. The one thing that I missed off this, which I think is incredibly important uh, to sustainability, is also the health of the farmer. And actually, that's probably needs to be at the top of the list. Because unless we are healthy and happy, we are never going to be able to make the changes that we have to make to reverse uh, decline in nature and also get ourselves uh, into some kind of shape to solving this climate change problem. Because actually, 
I've never enjoyed my farm more than I do at the moment. We can really see. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the Danish appetite for organic food and farming is really inspiring. And apparently, when the Copenhagen City Council have to buy food for public places like schools and hospitals, they put their money where their mouth is and lead the way in supporting sustainable farming systems, often apparently buying all organic food. Now, please ensure that your seatbelt is securely fastened. It's a climate action uh, farm visit today, Alice. Well, we're going to be thinking about what farms do generally, but also um, thinking about the, the sorts of actions farmers are taking to combat climate change and how climate change is affecting farmers. So we'll be looking at soil, looking at the weather station. Um, this afternoon is going to be fun. We're going to the agroforestry and we're going to actually plant some trees for the kids. We don't want to arouse anxiety, we want them to go away feeling positive um, about what adults are doing in agriculture to combat climate change and also to start thinking about what sorts of things they can do um, within their schools and perhaps even taking back into their families. They can look at their um, energy use, they can look at their water use, they can look at recycling, look at what carbon catches there are and, and maybe improve that by planting more things in the school grounds. Well, it's felt like a very, very late long autumn with the leaves determined to hang on to the trees. But suddenly the winter is upon us and the mornings are cold and damp and dark. Anyway, thank you for joining us at Shimpling Park Farm and see you next time. When I said we were coming to uh, Denmark, um, Alice said, oh, I'm, I'm a bit nervous about that. And I said, I said, why is that? And then she told me and I really understood it because we come from East Anglia. And we come from a small market town near, it's near Shimpling uh, called Bury St Edmunds. And the clue is in the name is that St Edmund is buried uh, in, in Bury St Edmunds. And you probably want to know what happened to uh, St. Devon. Well, um, <laughs> on the 20th of uh, November in uh, 896, you lot came over, and uh, he was doing terribly well, actually. He was actually the king of East Anglia, and he was doing a really good job of uniting the country. But then you lot came over, and uh, you tied him to an oak tree. And, uh, and then you filled him, filled him full of arrows, and, and not content with that, you put all your spears into him as well, and just to make sure you chopped off his head. So, you know, I understand why Alice might have felt a little bit nervous, but you know, that was 1,152 years ago, and actually, do you know, I think you've changed. <laughs>